I've got very great pleasure in introducing uh, John Anderson, who in fact has been a lifelong uh, militant and socialist. He was formerly president of the AUE, AUEW, UAW local in America, Local 15 in Detroit, and he's chairman of the 1937 uh, sit-down committee. And he's going to be talking on the uh, political problems of the American labour movement, taking a broad kind of uh, look at uh, the history of the movement and its developments from the end of the Russian Revolution to the present day, and then talking in some greater detail on the uh, problems of the auto industry immediately pre-war and its post-war development. John Anderson. I, I just want to say a word about uh, in, a word in appreciation of the help that the Socialist Workers Party of Great Britain has given our movement in America. Because without your movement here, I don't think we have anything in the United States today. And I feel that I have uh, gained considerable from reading the Socialist Worker and particularly the writings in the uh, your magazine and those books written by Tony Cliff. So I hope that I can make some contribution here today in your understanding <coughs> not only of the, of the American labor movement but of the international relations between the American labor movement and the British labor movement. In traveling around the country the last few days, I've gotten the impression the American capitalists control a good part of British industry. The names here are very similar to the names we have over there. Your enemy is our enemy. Now, back in 1920, Eugene V. Debs, while in Atlanta Penitentiary for his opposition to the First World War, received almost a million votes for the presidency of the United States. In order to prevent shipments of arms to put down the Russian Revolution, the workers in Seattle, Washington, called a general strike. And there were strikes in other ports to prevent the shipment of arms to the anti-Bolshevik forces. We see from this there was a considerable socialist movement in America prior to World War II. But then certain catastrophes affected the American labor movement. First, we had the large part of the radical movement the IWW and the Socialist Party sent to prison. Then we had the Palmer Raids. There were hundreds of radicals scooped up and shipped to Russia without a trial. And then, with the formation of the Communist Party, there was a wide split within the socialist movement. There was a right-wing socialist party and there was the communist party which itself split in two. One part going underground and the other trying to work above ground. But then something else happened. From <clears throat> There was the steel strike of 1919, which was defeated. 
There was the Shopman strike of 1922, a railroad strike, which was defeated. Now, you must understand the nature of the American Federation of Labor. It was sometimes referred to by the IWW as the American Separation of Labor. And I think that was an accurate description. On the railroads, there were 22 different unions. In construction, there were many, as many. And so, in each industry, there were separate unions. But these were unions largely of the skilled workers. They had no use for the unskilled, the people in the factories, the auto workers, the steel workers, the rubber workers, the electrical workers, and the growing industries of that period. And there was a strong anti-socialist and anti-communist strain in the American Federation of Labor. They feared the left wing as much as the employers, and they consistently worked with the employers, forming an alliance with them to prevent the organization of the mass production workers, because they feared if the mass production workers were organized, they would be displaced. Following the World War I, there was a great depression in agriculture. During the war, America had supplied food for Europe, and they had expanded their agriculture far beyond what was needed following the war. Once Europe was reconstructed and they began producing their own food, there was a, a severe depression in American agriculture, and there was be the beginning of the introduction of mechanization, the tractor. And as a result, uh, millions of farmers were forced off the land, and they moved into the cities. But for a period of some 22 years, or from a period of some 10 years, from 1922 to the middle of the Depression, 1932, there were practically no strikes in American industry. There was prosperity, or at least for a large part of the population outside of agriculture. I began my work in an auto plant in 1925 at the A.O. Smith Company in Milwaukee. Of course, there were no unions there, although the mayor of the city of Milwaukee, Dan Hone, was a socialist or he ran for mayor as a socialist and had been mayor since 1912, one never heard about unionism in the city of Milwaukee during those years. There was no attempt on the Socialist Party to organize the workers because they were working within the AF of L and they had pretty much the AF of L philosophy. They were not interested in the labor movement outside of the skilled workers. So during this period of 10 years, neither the Socialist nor the Communist Party developed any influence among the American workers. The capitalists were saying uh, Marx can be forgotten because we've solved the 
economic problems in America, we will have continuous prosperity for as long as we can see. And then came 1929. I was working in Detroit, in the auto plants, and I didn't have any trouble moving from one plant to another, from one job to another. There seemed to be plenty of work for everybody, and uh, everybody was uh, gambling on the stock market. Even the newsboys were investing their money on the stock market. Workers would buy a home, and then they would mortgage that home and buy another home. And there were millions of homes being built, all on mortgage. But they didn't understand the declining rate of profit. But that soon showed up. And on the 29th, of October 1929, you had the stock, first stock market crash. And uh, within a few days, billions and billions of dollars in paper was wiped out. And the layoffs began. The company would lay off 10% of the workforce and the other 90% would work that much harder to try and hold their jobs. And then they'd have to lay off another 10%. And the other 80% would do their best and work to the limit of their capacity and they still didn't reduce production enough. So they continued to lay off until they had sufficient to cut production. And before very long, you had unemployment of 25% and more in the industry. In 1929, the auto industry produced 5 million cars. They would not reach that production again for more than 20 years. Now, when these workers were laid off, there was no unemployment compensation. There was no uh, welfare as such organized by the state or the federal government. They were expected to rely on charity. Now, of course, uh, tens of thousands of these workers who were laid off had come from the farm, and many of them returned to the farm. But when they returned to those farms, they discovered they couldn't live there because there was no market for any of the products that they would produce. So poverty on the farm was no, no easier than poverty in the city. And people began riding the freight trains uh, north and south, east and west, looking for work. When I graduated from college in 1931, and 90% of the graduating class were not able to get jobs. And yet there was no provision whatsoever for us to live. And I often think back of how we really were able to live. Of course, uh, food was very cheap, but uh, nevertheless you had to eat, 
You had to get clothing, and you had to have shelter. And there sprang up around the cities of America shacks. They called them Hoover Wheels. Now, Herbert Hoover, the great engineer, was then president of the United States. And of course, he and his business partner said, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with, Ameri with the American economy. He would say, they would say, prosperity is just around the corner. And you know, the workers were looking around the corner for the next 10 years, and they didn't find prosperity. Some of them found it dressed in the uniform, being shipped around to various parts of the world. In 1932, after being unemployed for about 18 months, I was hired at the Dodge plant as a metal finisher, a trade which I had learned in 1926 in Milwaukee. I was hired on the 2nd of December. I hadn't worked for a period of two years at the trade. I hadn't done any physical labor. But I worked, they required that I work, 12 to 14 hours a day seven days a week, from the 2nd of December till the 24th of December. And I was notified at 11, uh, 7 o'clock that evening that I would be laid off till further notice. Now that was a job. It meant employment, but it was torture. It was the nearest thing to torture I have ever experienced because we were all working to the limit of our capacity and the place was dirty. There was no concern for the health of the workers and working as a metal finisher, you were working with lead and thousands and thousands of metal finishers were in the hospitals of Detroit with lead poisoning. Some of them for, were crippled for life, and some of them died of that disease. Well, I was paid 52 cents an hour uh, for work that I had been getting a dollar ten cents an hour in 1929. But putting in those kind of hours, uh, I, I was able to save a little money during those three weeks. But during that period of time, you only worked three or four, five months out of the year. You had to earn enough to live 12 months out of the year. So as soon as I got laid off from this job, I went to look for another job. And within a few days, I was hired at the Briggs Highland Park plant. And the saying went about this company, if poison don't work, try Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> because it was known as a butcher shop. More workers were injured, and uh, there was more, uh, no regard for the health or the welfare of the worker. And of course, there was a high turnover. But this being at the bottom of the Depression, we all desperately needed jobs. Well, we were hired for 52 cents an hour, but they never paid us what was promised on our hiring slip. Each week they would cut us five, six, or seven cents. So at the end of three weeks, I was making 35 cents an hour as a metal finisher. Well, 
Uh, we were beginning to, uh, the metal finishes were a little more independent than any other trade because at that time we could go from one shop to another and get work. So we finally put up an argument about this cutting our wages without uh, notifying us. and We wanted to know what we were going to be paid. So the foreman said, well, if you don't like your job, why don't you quit? And they took us over to the window and they said, you see all those men lined up there at the employment office? They'll take your jobs. So we got together and when they said, uh, uh, you can quit if you want to, we all quit as a body. We walked out of the plant. And in a few minutes, uh, there were two or three thousand outside milling around without an organization, without a union, without anybody to speak for them. Well, I uh, felt obligated to get up and speak for the workers. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> I was elected to go to see the plant manager about uh, our wages with the two or three other pe people. Well, he said, we'll reestablish your wage at 52 cents an hour. I said, fine, you put that in writing, we'll take it out to the workers. No, he said, we won't put anything in writing. And I said, if it's not worth, worth putting in writing, it isn't worth taking it out to the workers. Well, we weren't up there more than 10 or 15 minutes. Then we were brought to the window and said, well, the communists have taken charge of this strike. Now, the Communist Party did have what was known as the Auto Workers Union. It, is some, it was something they had captured uh, in times past when there was a union in some of the plants uh, during the Second World War. Well, <clears throat> I didn't want to become identified with the Communist Party at the time, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I was elected to the strike committee. At that time, the Communist Party had the line uh, that every, the Social Democrats were social fascists. Uh, Roosevelt was a social fascist. Uh, the mayor, the liberal mayor was a social fascist. The AFL was a bunch of gangsters, and the IWW was a bunch of gangsters. So it was rather repulsive, but that was the only group that made any attempt to organize the workers there. Well, after two or three weeks, we learned that the company had, had raised the wages and uh, uh, were calling the people back to work. With the help of the police and the welfare department and the press and all the other agencies of uh, the establishment, uh, the strike was broken. But, uh, and of course, we who led the strike were blacklisted. But a blacklist didn't last, didn't mean much then, because you could change your name and go to work possibly for the same company, only at a different plant. And that is what I did. But uh, it wasn't long. Uh, before I was laid off at one plant and sent to another plant where I was recognized. And of course I was fired. Now the AF of L uh, made a little attempt to organize those workers. But the IWW did come in and attempt to organize a few, few of them with little success. But 
On the 4th of March, 1933, Roosevelt uh, was inaugurated President of the United States. Hitler had come to power in Germany only a few months before that. When, Hitler, when Roosevelt came to power, he promised the American people a new deal. Well, a couple of days after he was inaugurated, the banks of the country were closed. And, of course, he did something about it. The big banks were guarantees, were given the guarantee of the government, government credit. The small banks, the small investors and depositors were allowed to go under. And in a little while, within the first hundred days, they passed what was known as the National Industrial Recovery Act. Uh, this was supposed to establish levels of wages and prices and so on in order to stabilize the economy. Well, the rules were laid down uh, by the employers where in industries where there wasn't any organization, the workers and the consumers had no voice. So prices were pegged at a higher level and there was a monopoly for the, for the people who manufactured goods, but the workers' wages were, went down instead of up, and they were worse off than they were before. But there was a section in that law which said, which was supposed to guarantee the workers the right to organize into unions of their own choosing. And, of course, uh, uh, thousands and thousands of workers joined the unions. They joined federal locals organized by the AFL. I have joined the IWW and had myself fired five or six times within the next year. Well, uh, the question was raised whether or not the company unions would be recognized as in compliance with Section 7A of this National Recovery Act. And the FDR said it did. Now, uh, I heard over the radio that the President of the United States saying the first thing that I would do if I were in a worker in the plant, would be to join a union. Well, those workers who followed that advice soon discovered that they didn't have a job. Uh, he was in favor of company unions, unions that never went on strike. But if you went on strike, he would have nothing to do with it and would give you no aid. As a matter of fact, he tried to break the strikes. And in 1934, the General Motors workers had voted to strike. But when the President said that these company unions, these works councils, would uh, be in compliance with the law while the company uh, organized uh, works councils throughout the auto industry. But they were useless as far as the workers were concerned. They succeeded in liquidating the AFL federal locals and uh, soon the company unions dissolved because of the lack of interest on the part of the workers. 
I went to work, uh, well, I might say that in 1935, uh, there had been a debate in the AFL about organizing industrial unions. And John L. Lewis, being president of the United Mine Workers, saw the need for industrial unions that would organize the steel industry an industry which it controlled a large part of the coal industry. He saw his own union threatened unless these production workers were organized. And he proceeded to organize the Congress of Industrial Organization, first known as the Committee for Industrial Unionism. Well, as soon as this was organized, uh, the rubber workers uh, joined, and they introduced a tactic which was to spread uh, throughout the auto industry. In January and February 1936, uh, they had sit-down strikes in the rubber plants of Akron, Ohio. And they organized the unemployed. They had tens of thousands of workers sitting in the plants <coughs> and manning the picket lines. And when they uh, tried to organize the police and uh, company guards to break the strike, they discovered they didn't, their forces weren't large enough. And the rubber industry began organizing or began bargaining with the rubber workers union. <clears throat> the, the auto workers uh, were too also were looking for an industrial union. Under the AFL, their officials had been appointed and they had federal locals were not which were not in an international union but were affiliated directly with the American Federation of Labor. But in May 1936, they held a convention in South Bend, Indiana, in which they elected their own officers. At that convention, <coughs> uh, the Communist Party uh, was a, uh, a considerable force. Uh, they tried to introduce a resolution that, or a, uh, an amendment to the Constitution at that convention barring communists from holding office. But uh, the conservative forces, which were in a majority, were outmaneuvered, and they weren't able to pass that or adopt that uh, amendment to the Constitution. They passed a resolution calling for a Labor Party. Uh, they passed a resolution calling for a 30-hour week with 40 hours pay. They uh, indicated that unless the um, auto industry bargained with the union, they were prepared to call a general strike. Now, the people elected to office were generally younger people. Uh, people with radical ideas. Wyndham Mortimer, uh, probably the most experienced unionist in the, uh, in the UAW at the time, was a member of the Communist Party. Walter Ruther <coughs> was a member of the Communist Party and the Socialist Party as well, which I was also a member of. Uh, they didn't, they couldn't organize anybody in the summertime because the plants, most all of them, were shut down. But in the fall of 1936, there was a slight rise in production in the auto industry, and uh, General Motors uh, hired a few thousand people. Uh, I was one of them. <coughs> uh, I had been... Uh, to an IWW convention in November 1936, uh, but they had no plans or ability to organize.
So I joined the UAW and began organizing my plan. <clears throat> I attended uh, conferences of General Motors workers in Flint. Uh, these conferences formalized the demands that were to be placed on the company and worked out the strategy which, were, which was to be used in the strike. And uh, some of the, of course, the main demand was uh, collect the right to bargain collectively. And the UAW asked for exclusive bargaining rights in the plants which they had organized. They had spoke <clears throat> of the 30-hour week with 40 hours paid. They wanted a steward system as a bargaining, as a method of bargaining and worker representation. They asked that the elimination of the piecework system, uh, the piecework rate plan, which we had, uh, <clears throat> we were in opposition to, and they wanted all the workers to have seniority rights so that you would be hired and laid off according to the, your seniority. So, <clears throat> although I had only hired in at this plant on the 24th of November, uh, within six weeks we were prepared to strike the plant. Now, these workers had been disillusioned so many times and and demoralized that it was almost impossible to organize them. And after six weeks, we had fewer than 50 members in the UAW. But nevertheless, uh, we felt we could shut the plant down. Uh, the most important plants in the auto industry and the body industry at that time were the stamping plants. And the strategy that was used was to close two of the stamping plants which provided the stampings for all General Motors bodies. The one was in Flint, known as Fisher Body One. The other was in Cleveland. And those plants were struck the last days of December 1936. I was in the Fleetwood Fisher Body Plant in Detroit which made bodies for Cadillac. Uh, we called a sit-down strike on the 8th of January, 1937. Well, with only 50 members signed up, we were a little nervous about whether or not we could, ho we could hold the plant. <clears throat> but uh, fortunately, the company decided to close the plant and my problem was to get the people to a meeting in the plant where they could be organized uh, for a strike. We held a meeting in the cafeteria uh, at which I spoke and outlined the uh, strategy and reasons for the strike, and uh, we decided to run a sit-down. Well, there were only 94 people there, and I think the vote was something like 47 for a sit-down and 45 against. But nevertheless, we had the sit-down strike. Now, we've read a, some of us, or some of you may have read the story of the General Motors strike, and it's been exactly, the number of people involved in the strike has generally been exaggerated. Uh, not more than five, and at most 10% of the people employed took any active part in the strike. But it being a sit-down strike in Flint, Flint was a General Motors town, and the sit-down tactic was used because, after all, it's rather cold in Flint in January, and it being a, a General Motors town, they controlled the police, they had the judges, and uh, <clears throat> all the instruments of government. So uh, it wasn't, wouldn't be easy for them to evict the strikers. So uh, the strike went on 
for several weeks. But uh, the uh, police, in an attempt to cut off the food supply, uh, were defeated by the supporters of the strike on the outside as well as those on the inside. Those on the inside used the water hoses and all kinds of missiles to drive the police away. And uh, <clears throat> when this was done, the governor of Michigan, uh, Frank Murphy, a liberal Democrat, sent the National Guard in. And, uh, well, of course, he was supposed to have been a friend of labor. But at one point, he tried to cut off the food supply of the, of the strikers. But this, uh, uh, this tactic didn't work because the strikers uh, opened the doors and windows of the plants and threatened to freeze the uh, sprinkler system, which would have caused the insurance policies to lapse. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, uh, they, the company, uh, FDR, the governor, and all these forces tried to get the workers to evacuate the plants and uh, then bargain with the corporation. But they refused to evacuate the plants, and because Ford and Chrysler and the independents were supplying the market, General Motors finally capitulated to the Union and recognized their basic demands. <clears throat> At the ratification meeting, I had my first serious disagreement with Walter Ruther and the leadership of the UAW. There was nothing in the agreement which provided for a shop steward system uh, and, or any other means of representation. That was to be decided later on. Now, I felt the shop steward system, such as you had in, the, in, the, in Britain, uh, during World War I and after was what we needed. But Walter Ruther was a very convincing speaker, and he could sell an agreement that no one else could sell. He told the delegates there, he says, now Rome wasn't built in a day. And he says, you people want a new house with a little red fence around it. Now, I know we didn't get everything we should, but upon my word of honor, I will see that in 1938 you get a shop steward system. Well, they accepted the agreement, but we never did get the shop steward system, and we don't have it today, and that was a serious setback for the Union. Well, the General Motors strike was a huge victory because they set the example for the entire industry. And as a result of that strike, <clears throat> we were able to organize Chrysler and all the, the smaller plants, the supplier plants, the independents. And within a few months, the UAW had grown from 25,000 members in May to more than 400,000 members the following May. But we weren't able to f organize the Ford Motor Company. Uh, this, uh, that company took a hard-nosed position. And uh, <clears throat> when they were trying to hand out handbills around the plant, the company had uh, two or three thousand goons uh, who were used to suppress any form of organization. And some of you may have uh, seen the film on the Battle of the Overpass. Well, Walter Ruther uh, was in that battle, but nothing is shown of the 50 other people who were passing out the bills, some of whom were injured far worse than he was in that particular fray. But that pub the publicity 
of that battle uh, gave Ruther a national standing, and he was to use it uh, for the next uh, uh, 30-some years to establish himself as a militant leader. Well, <clears throat> we established a union, but at the head of the union was a man by the name of Homer Martin, who had been a minister of the gospel before he became president of the UAW. And he wanted to play God in the union. And uh, he started to work with the corporations to have the militants fired. They revised, the <clears throat> they wrote the, con the GM contract so that anybody involved in any kind of a dispute over production standards, anybody who restricted output or uh, tried to create a situation of solidarity within the plant, they were fired with the endorsement of the president of the union. And in that way, it didn't take long before the union uh, was seriously demoralized. Now, the Communist Party members, Walter Ruther and Wynda Mortimer, uh, went along with this program because after Roosevelt came uh, into office, he recognized uh, the Soviet Union. After 16 years, they established dip diplomatic relations with Russia. And instead of being a social fascist, he became a, the president of the people. Uh, the uh, Popular Front had become uh, established uh, between the socialists and the communists, and uh, they were adopting a support of capitalist politicians. Then we had the World War II began in August 1939. For a period of time, there was a division between the Social Democrats and the Stalinists within the labor movement. Well, the CP during a, that period of the Stalin-Hitler Pact uh, did some constructive work in organizing the aircraft industry and <coughs> in organizing uh, such plants as the Ford Motor Company. Uh, the Ford was organized in April 1931, or, uh, 1941. But as uh, the war clouds came nearer to the United States, uh, Roosevelt became more and more anti-labor, and they introduced all kinds of bills in Congress threatening the very existence of the Union. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December uh, 1941, the labor bureaucracy were, was quick to pledge to the President of the United States that there would be no work stoppages until the Japanese and the Germans were defeated. And the employers used that as a signal uh, to uh, eliminate the Union, to ignore the Union. And uh, they were able to do that in some uh, areas, but not completely. The workers persisted to strike in, in, at times in spite of the leadership. But uh, with, the, uh, <clears throat> with the draft and the army always confronting you, if you were less than 38 years of age, and if you didn't take a position of not only supporting the war, but opposing all strikes and uh, going along, you were subject to being drafted into the service. <coughs> I was drafted into the service, as were thousands of other <coughs> men uh, 38 years and, un and under. <coughs> well, after three, after three or four years, uh, the Union was pretty well uh, undermined. But as soon as the war ended in Europe, uh, strikes began 
in spite of what the bureaucracy did or said. But there was no attempt on the part of the leadership to give expression to this strike and this protest on the part of the workers. Well, Walter Ruther's stock had gone down very sharply during the war, and he saw the possibility that if he were to lead a General Motors strike, he could become the foremost leader in the UAW, because the workers generally blamed the president of the union and others for their misfortune, for the degeneration of the union. <clears throat> And Walter Ruther went along with the workers. He didn't really give it leadership, but when the workers voted overwhelmingly to strike the General Motors Corporation, he did give it leadership. But there was no coordination. Now, there were those of us who advocated an industry-wide strike in the auto industry. But uh, the leadership of the UAW, including Walter Ruther, wanted to strike them one at a time. While we were on strike in General Motors, they had a settlement in, in uh, uh, Ford and Chrysler at about half the wage increase that we were demanding. <clears throat> and as a result, we were forced to go back to work with an 18 uh, cent wage increase when we had asked for a 30 percent. Well, there were strikes in steel, in rubber, in the electrical plants, in packing house, and so on. But each of the labor bureaucrats were looking after their own, uh, their own position. How could they advance their own position? There was no bringing together of these huge forces. And as a result, <clears throat> the employers were able to cut us down uh, to uh, the lowest common denominator. And a few months after the strike was over, prices rose so rapidly that the economic gains that we made during the strike were practically wiped out. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the Taft-Hartley law was passed in uh, June 1947. And this was the law, this was a law which uh, really tied the hands of the workers. And a secondary boycott was outlawed. And practically all activity. And instead of fighting this law, uh, the labor bureaucracy uh, used it against the rank and file. Then the Cold War began, the witch hunt began, and Walter Ruther used this to gain uh, undisputed control of the UAW. And he was to spread this to the entire CIO. And as a result, uh, the opposition were practically eliminated from the American labor movement. And when you don't have dissent, when you don't ha aren't al allowed an opposition, the union degenerates and becomes an agent of the employer. And that's what the UAW and most of the American labor movement has become today. And I was glad to hear your debate last night on the question of organizing the rank and file. And that is what I've been doing. And when I get back to Detroit, I will use some of the things that I've learned here to implement and convince the workers that this is the line we will have to follow. Thank you.